All right, jumping in here, Brian, thanks for joining us on the PAIR program. Um, this is another episode of uh, a mini-series that we call How We Hatched. And so this is a little bit more of just a fun discussion to hear a little bit more about your unique career journey and where you came from and how you arrived at this current point in your seat today as a CEO and co-founder of Loric Games. Uh, so I always like to start by just having you, you know, provide the listeners with the the quick overview of Lord Games. You know, what what is it that you guys do here? Um, and and for our listeners that may not know or are familiar with what what is a game studio, fill us in on that. Sure. Look, I mean, a game studio is exactly what it sounds like. It makes video games. Uh, I think in the, in the end, we're really focused on bringing story to what's referred to as a survival or sandbox genre. So we are focused on PC, predominantly Steam games. Our goal is to really help our players experience a heroic journey in a genre that's typically kind of shallow in how it approaches um, user journey and what the player can do and how they experience it with their friends. My co-founder and I really love Audible. We listen to books constantly. Mm -hmm. I'm massively dyslexic, so it's the only way that I can actually take that kind of stuff in. And that's really what began our journey is comparing the books we listen to, the narrators we listen to, which is actually a big part of it. And, and thinking about all of our experience in video game, we're huge game nerds. Um, my co-founder founded a, a game studio many years ago called Mythic Entertainment. So he's been doing this for 30 years. And really thinking about how we bring these two things together more seamlessly than it's done in the past. So that's kind of our focus as Lord Games is focused on narrative st- storytelling for the survival genre. Cool. Yeah. And we'll, we'll dive a, a bit deeper into that here uh, shortly, but... I like to now flash back a little bit, right? Let's let's uh, peel back who is who is Brian Johnson. So t- tell us about your journey, you know, starting from the roots. You know, where where did you grow up, and and how did you get into you know, the world of tech and and obviously the world of, of gaming? Yeah, so o- grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, it turns out not a ton to do there. Grew up in Tulsa, <laughs> um, and so you know, growing up in the in the eighties, I really found computers at a young age. I just got lucky. It just happened. And um, I had a 386. Actually, I started with a 286 and and really got into gaming from that. That's sort of what led me down that journey. You know, Bolton board systems and that led to MUDs and of course then led to DOS games like Sierra games. In fact, I have a Sierra online tattoo because that's where it all started. And really beginning my journey started with video games, but it went from there. I, I started looking at how games were made and how Bolton boards were written uh, started getting to programming because of that. And that's really where it all began. It all started with DOS games and really my love of storytelling and the creative outlet that programming gives you. And I just kept going from there. So I started writing code when I was uh, reasonably young, around nine nine or 10 years old. So my first real language was Pascal. Uh, for those who are interested, Turbo Pascal 7. Um, <laughs> and it really went from there. My entire childhood revolved around the time I could spend in front of my computer, whether it was playing video games, or writing code, or just working on pet projects, whatever it was. And ultimately, I got involved in a group called 2600, which is a um, magazine from the 90s. It was a hacking magazine. And they would do these meetings at like mall food courts around the world, around the country, um, a bunch of nerds. And again, this, these are my people. And so I would go to the food court every other, or every, the first Friday of every month. And eventually started turning into every Saturday meeting with these other security focused computer nerds all focused on Linux and programming and gaming and all sorts of stuff. We were those really nerdy people in the middle of the food court in the nineties. So like it was, that's where it kind of continued to go. That led me down a path of security and, and looking at um, Linux and, and thinking about system administration and thinking about security of those things and how that can impact the IT and everything else that went with it. So I really had those two loves, which was video gaming and security. And of course, computers being at the center of that. And that really guided my life from there on out. I sort of oscillated between those two things pretty much my entire career. I went and worked at Electronic Arts for a little period of time. And then I went and worked for um, a company doing offensive uh, security, doing exploit development. And I went back to gaming where I worked at uh, Mythic and EA again. And then I left Mythic and EA and created a company called Divi Cloud, which was a uh, cloud security company. We grew that company to about 75 people. I was a CEO founder um, for that organization, grew to about 75, 80 people and sold it to Rapid7 in 2020. It was an an excellent outcome for everyone. And now I'm back making uh, video games. So my life is just sort of bouncing back and forth in those two things. But I think the most important thing to take away from me is 
Uh, I am very fortunate to get to do what I love and how important that is to me cannot be understated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fascinating journey. Um, I love how, you know, a lot of folks, you know, kind of always ask, you know, how, how do you start something or, you know, how do you get connected with the right folks? And sounds like, uh, you know, that, that mall food court, you guys were maybe just throwing down on some Auntie Annie's and, and Jamba Juice and, uh, getting, uh, getting that networking going, but that's, that's a really cool journey. Um, obviously it's a, a couple of zigzags, but it sounds like it all kind of stayed central within, you know, working with, with computers and, and, and really kind of pursuing something that you knew, you know, you were passionate about, which kept, kept you going. Yeah. I think for, for me in particular, it's different for everyone. Um, but I have a laundry list of learning disabilities and that made it difficult for me in school, um, you know, to, to, to excel. And so mm -hmm. this was something that I could be good at and something that I could enjoy and have a creative outlet. Actually, a lot of people mm -hmm. don't consider programming or even security as being creative, but it's actually incredibly creative because of the number of things, you, different paths you can take and different ways you can do things. So it provides that outlet to people. And for, for someone like myself who found the keyboard was easier than writing, who um, struggled with reading and found that I could do it better if it was something I was engaged and passionate about versus some textbook I got at school. Mm. And then quite frankly, because, you know, as a younger person, not being excelling in school, not really excelling in sports, it gave me somewhere to be and something to belong to. Mm. And that probably meant more than anything else and really drove that passion. So I think as people think about where they're happy in life and think about like, you know, I'm bouncing between all these different things you're doing in life. There is oftentimes a core thing that ties that stuff together. Sometimes it just takes a little exploration to figure out what that is. Yeah, it sounds like you found it pretty early on too. Um, so going back to um, to Mythic, right? Because it sounds like this is a pretty important area where you, you meet some folks here too that you know that come uh, come full circle with you here up over at Loric as well, but. Um, what was your role at Mythic? And, and you know, tell me about the progressions in, in that uh, company. You know, why, what, do, what do you think you gained from that experience that's been so valuable for you as a professional? Oh, man. Um, I can tell you the first big thing that I gained that has really played a huge role in my life has been what, the, the job I had before I went to Mythic. I worked for an errant service provider, um, and it was my first real career. I would say out of college, but I didn't graduate. So I'll just say after I left college, it was my first real job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you got to remember, I, I spent my entire life leading up to this moment, the moment I could finally get paid to do what I love to do. It was a system administration, system administration job. And I was at the job for about a year and I hated it. I absolutely was super unhappy to go to work every day. It was awful. And it led me through a real like identity crisis. Did I just spend my entire youth focused on something I don't actually like? Uh, has it always just been a hobby and could it never be a profession? And that was a real moment for me. Uh, so I left uh, through just serendipitous situation, ended up at Mythic and uh, and left my job and went to go join Mythic because I love games. I was like, well, let's go do this. When I got there, I remember about a month and a half into my job at Mythic, I woke up one day, walked over to my computer, which happened to be in my bedroom because I just had one room, and started writing an email to my boss saying that I was going to take a personal day and work on my own personal security projects. Um, and about halfway through the email, I kind of stopped writing and I was like, wait a minute, what am I going to do here that I'm not going to do at work? The only difference is I'm going to do like a different type of programming at work or a different type of sysadmin stuff. And I'm going to go to lunch with people I like, and I'm still going to play video games. So like, what am I doing? And I just deleted the email and went to work. And I haven't worked a day since then. And that was when I was 23, no, 24. And I think the, the lesson that I took away from that that's been so critical for me is the reason I wanted to go to work is because the people there were awesome. Mm -hmm. And I loved working them. And the stuff we were working on was cool and interesting. And it meant so much to me as I moved on to create my next company for Divi was that culture really, really matters. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between taking somebody who uh, loves what they're doing and someone who hates what they're doing. It may be the same thing in two different places, but who you're doing it with really, really, really matters. That set me up for all sorts of decisions I made moving forward in my life. So that's the most pivotal thing. It turns out that the people that I worked with at Mythic 
and you know went on with me to create other things. Divi Cloud, my co-founder in Divi Cloud was my co-worker at Mythic. My mm-hmm. co-founder in Lorik was my boss at Mythic. So it, you know, these these relationships matter. The culture matters. And in fact, I would say culture is the most important thing you can build as a CEO uh, that is lasting. Yeah, that's a uh, that's incredible insight. Um, you know, that's obviously you know we we've worked with you guys at Divi Cloud, and uh, you know, in those early stages, um, I'm always fascinated to hear you know how how it is that you craft culture. Um, you know, for, for the first say you know five to to twenty five folks that come in, um, you know, what is it that you're you're kind of looking for with those individuals that you feel will you know adapt well into that you know that quick fast moving environment? Um, you know, some folks have a philosophy like at Hatch, right? We're you know we just like to hire nice people, right? Like nobody wants to work with somebody who's a jerk. Uh, what is it that you kind of keep as part of a philosophy to to keep a culture that you would feel proud about, feel good about? Well, first and foremost, uh, culture begins, and it sounds like an obvious statement, right? But culture begins with hiring. Um, you know, any budding CEOs out there and founders, you know, your, your job as a CEO is really three, there's just three things you have to do. And that is you need to make sure the company doesn't run out of money. You need to ensure the company has a vision and you're executing on it. And you need to attract and retain top talent. That's it. That's your job. And so, you know, as a CEO and thinking about recruiting and culture, that's where it all begins. Hmm. Um, if you don't bring the right people in, people in, you're going to have a crap culture. It's just the way it works. And to some degree, if you let that go too long, it becomes almost too hard to rectify because culture sort of starts to foster its own subculture, if you will. So it starts with hiring. And I think when we hire, not to go with three things again, but we do hire, we look specifically for three traits. We look for people who are passionate about what they do. We look for people who have what we refer to as a high emotional IQ. It's a long-winded way of saying don't be an asshole. Mm-hmm. And we look for people who are want to own something, want to drive something through, really want to leave their mark on it. And we find by hiring for those three things, you find you start to build a culture of people who you want to be around, who uh, bring energy to the table and invigorate you to go do more. And because they're nice people, you want to go to lunch with them. You want to go get drinks with them after work. It's not like it's a chore. Mm. I can't tell you how important that is. And so when you start recruiting, identifying whatever is important to you about your culture, about what you want to uh, have and deliver, distill it down to something simple. Make sure you're hiring for those. And it doesn't matter if the person has the right skills. They can learn skills. You cannot teach people how to not be a jerk. Like They just can't happen. Right. So, Start out with the core values you want, hire from that, and then people can learn skills as they go, especially if they're passionate and especially if they want to own things. Yeah, well said. Um, you know, so so I'm, I'm going to circle back into this story here. So it's it's around you know 2013 or so. You know, you're you're getting ready to start Divi. So tell me about that transition from Mythic into, you know, what gave you the confidence to feel like, hey, you know what, I'm going to go out and start my own thing here. Um, you know, what what was that driving factor? And, you know, I always ask this to every entrepreneur. Um, is that something that, you know, you felt was, uh, you know, you're, you're, were your folks entrepreneurs? You know, where do you find you, that comes from for you? Yeah, it's a great question. And I've actually given a lot of thought to that particular thing. Um, to, to answer the first part, hopefully succinctly, is that um, it wasn't like I woke up and thought, I have this amazing idea. It was more that I kept seeing everybody else raising money and starting companies. And I was like, why can't I do that? Like, <laughs> you, know, you just see these headlines and you're like, I can go do that. Let's try it. Yeah. But I think that actually fosters into something that, that or sort of leads into something that's actually more important. It took me a long time to realize um, that, you know, people who struggle academically or struggle in their lives in any different way, it's not just academic, tend to learn how to fail. And I think when I was a kid, because of that, I learned how to fail often. And it wasn't really a learn how to fail. I did fail often. I barely graduated high school. Um, and I think that taught me how to be resilient. And it also taught me that failure is a natural part of life. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a learning experience. You just build a thick skin around it. So as you're an entrepreneur and you're out there starting something, there's a couple of ingredients that are kind of nice. And that is the one, you don't know what you're doing. And so you're real naive. So when someone tells you you can't do something, you're like, whatever, yes, I can, because you don't know any better. And the second part about it is if you come to the conclusion that failure is okay, 
And that like, well, the worst thing that's going to happen is you go start a company and a year later you're out finding a job again. So what? Mm -hmm. And like, I think people get trapped in that fear of failing, but whatever, you're going to fail at a thousand things all done. Mm -hmm. So just don't worry about that. Just start eating a whale one bite at a time and eventually you'll get there. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's great. That's well said. Um, you know, I think, uh, one of those consistent, you know, traits that we see in, in, in leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, founders, um, is resilience, you know, having that grit, having that build, ability to, to get over, uh, rejection and, and rejection, uh, often heard. Um, you know, one of those three things that you pointed out as part of a CEO is, uh, you know, funding, right. You know, you know, bringing in that, that, that money to, to get things rolling and, and, uh, you know, extending runway, um, you know, at Divi cloud, you know, what was it that you believe, you know, investors were really buying into, uh, when they were, when they were, you know, presenting you a check, uh, was it the, the concept, the topic, or do you think it was the team that you all had assembled? Uh, what, what was it that helped you kind of get some of that, that funding secured in the early days? Well, I can assure you that what I thought was getting us funding uh, was not actually the case. Um, you know, I thought I had this amazing idea, and Chris and I—I I didn't say I—we had this amazing idea of how we were going to change the world and cloud. You know, how we we're going to make cloud computing so much better. I think, in retrospect, as I look back on that, first off, we didn't end up building what we said we were going to build, and we built something entirely different. Um, and that, you know, it, that's fine. I think people bet on the on Chris and I. Um, they saw two people who were very passionate about what we were doing. And who had experience in the industry. We had spent our time at Mythic when I was there. You had asked this question earlier. I spent a lot of my time on the ops side doing system mm -hmm. administration um, and building the ops team and, and running and deploying these massive multiplayer online games. And I think the you know through that experience, we, we migrated the cloud uh, during like 2011. We did the migration from data centers to cloud. And yes, that's what gave us some of the ideas we wanted to have. And that gave us credibility when we were raising money from investors they weren't betting on the idea as much as I thought they were. They were betting on Chris and I. And, and as I look back on that now and as in my own interactions with, with uh, advising entrepreneurs, that is that the core team is the, one of the most important things. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll hear a theme here, people, people, people. Mm -hmm. like that's what matters. And in the end, the team of Chris and myself and one of our other founders, Andrew Mann, who unfortunately ended up passing away a few years into the, uh, into the startup, those three people brought ideas to the table, but more importantly, they we knew the industry well enough to be able to pivot when we needed to. Mm -hmm. And that's what the investors are banking on. So if you're starting a startup and you're looking around the table, the people you're doing it with, and none of you have lived or breathed the thing you're trying to solve for, you may want to consider a different approach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but if it's because that's what people are going to bank on, that's what they're going to say. This is a team that can go and be resilient and pivot and figure it out because any entrepreneur will tell you, you have two things wrong with any business when it first starts, your budget and your idea. So just embrace <laughs> that. It's cool. And just roll with it. And you'll figure it out as you go. You don't have to be right today. You just eventually have to be right. That's all. Right. Yeah. Just two minor things like your budget and your idea. Like that's yeah. change those. and You're good. <laughs> oh, that's great. So you know, so, um, you know, as a local, a local founder here, I'll, I'll give, you know, Divi Cloud a huge shout out. You know, we, we looked at you guys as a, as a startup sweetheart, you know, you guys, like you mentioned, you were, you were right in that sweet spot, right? I mean, startups were really starting to take off in the DC area in 2013 to 2015 and, and it's steamrolled since then. Um, you spent seven years at Divi Cloud building this, you know, what you would pro probably call your baby at this time. Um, you know, what, um, what was it, you know, timing wise, right? Why did, did you just feel like, you know, it was time to, to, to sell or, you know, did you guys have ideas and, uh, you know, early on of like how big you wanted to get this thing to before an exit? Um, you know, what, what goes through your minds and when you're, you know, planning, uh, you know, like seven years from now, this thing will be sold. I, I always like to hear that because, um, oftentimes you're just trying to see like what's next year going to hold. Um, how, how did that play out for you guys? Um, you know, and getting to that, that exit. Yeah. I mean, we, weren't thinking about selling when we were approached. I mean, you're always taking meetings, but mm -hmm. they're always, you never think it's actually going to happen. I mean, even looking back on it, you know, that was always the goal, but you don't actually think it, like really believe it's going to happen. And, and as we got to that moment, I didn't want to sell. Um, 
you know, my co-founders and I, we looked at it. We are all sort of having, a, we we're having a lot of fun. This, the, the company was finally really scaling. We have been doubling revenue for three or four years and really just been doing a great job. Mm-hmm. We had a great team. And in fact, one of my, our, none of our investors wanted us to sell. And one of them, uh, Kirill, he was a, just an amazing investor and partner. Um, you know, he sort of said, look, you're never going to have a team like this again. Um, I don't know if he's right or wrong about that, but it certainly it made me it gave me pause. So we didn't really want to sell necessarily. But then I talked to another one of my friends who had been through an exit and said, how do you know if it's the right thing? Mm-hmm. And he just said, look, write down the top five things that matter to you about selling your company. Like, what do you want to get out of it? What is what is good look like? And I sat down and, and wrote down. I can't remember all of them exactly, but I can certainly remember the top ones was, you know, that the people that everyone made money. Not just the founders, not just the investors, but everybody in the company got to make money. That the company they were going to was a good culture, a good place for people to go to and and grow. So you know they're going to leave Diddy Cloud behind and go join this other organization. It's going to be a good home for them, right? Mm-hmm. That that we could go into a company and that our product was going to not just be a tuck in or an add on, but we were going to help lead change any of the company we were joining or the market that we were growing into. Mm-hmm. It, and I think in the end, all those, and there's a couple more in there that I can't remember, but I do remember them being five. In the end, all the boxes were checked. Mm-hmm. And I called my friend back and I said, all the boxes are checked, man. He said, that is rare. Usually mm-hmm. going through an exit, you have to give up on one or two things. Maybe it's not exactly the right company, but the money is good. Or maybe the money is not great, but maybe the company is beautiful. Like whatever it is, you're kind of giving up on some. Maybe not all the employees get to actually make money this time. Mm-hmm. In this case, we did. And he said, then if this is what good looks like and this meets good, what are you waiting for? And mm-hmm. I think that really sort of got me thinking about it and thinking about like, look, the, you know, there's, no, there's chapters beyond this chapter that I get to go do. I'm going to go back to making video games and that kind of stuff. So even though I was having, I mean, it was hard for me. My wife will tell you, I woke up every day during the acquisition questioning why we were doing it because I loved going to work every day. Um, but in the end, all those criteria were met. People made money. The employees made money. The employees had stable, great jobs and a good culture mm-hmm. to go join. You can't ask for anything more than that. So yeah. go out on top and go on to the next thing. Yeah. And the timing was interesting too, right? Was, so was this uh, right in the heart of the pandemic? Oh, yeah. Uh, we sold the company. I signed the paperwork uh, in the first quarter of 2020. Wow. Um, so we had literally um, met with them in Vegas in December thinking there was no way they were going to put up the money we asked for. They came back in January. They made an offer and exceeded our expectations. Uh, Corey, the CEO over there, who's just a tremendous CEO, and I got to go out to dinner and I got to know him. We spent about five minutes on price and about two hours on culture. And that, huh. and that, told, me it was like, that told me this is the right thing, right? But again, this is all during pandemic, so we're trying to be all like sketchy. And I went into the office <laughs> two weeks later to excuse people to go home and saying, look, we're, we're all going to go home for a little bit because of this whole pandemic thing. I'll see you guys in a month, right? Mm-hmm. That obviously didn't happen. And so a month goes by, the deal gets closed. I have to announce to the company um, over Zoom that we're being acquired. And it was this sort of bittersweet moment because we didn't get to really celebrate together yeah. as a team. Um, I didn't get to meet people in person when I gave out individual letters showing them how much money they made, like Mm -hmm. all these missed opportunities for them and for myself. But in the end, um, it still worked out great. The acquisition went incredibly well. We had basically no attrition uh, through the first two years of being a part of Rapid7. So I think the pandemic was sort of a crazy time for it to happen, but it happened Mm -hmm. and we all did okay. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, one just awesome stat you just threw out there. You said two years with, with no attrition after post acquisition. Uh, that's that's remarkable. Um, when you sold, uh, what was the headcount? Do you recall of, of Divi Cloud at that time? Somewhere between seventy five and eighty. Um, I can't pinpoint it exactly because we were growing really, really fast at that yeah. point. So I don't exactly know where it landed, but it was about seventy five or eighty. Yeah, there was a <clears throat> there was a couple of years where that was just rapid growth. Um, I always like to ask this question too. So you know, just under a hundred in headcount. You know, what was your favorite? Do you had did you have a favorite stage of 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 running Divi Cloud? Was it under ten? Was it twenty five to fifty? Uh, when when was you know a time where you're like, man, that was that was a blast? 
I mean, the whole thing sounds like it was a blast, but what does there a certain time that you you'd say stands out? Yeah. I mean, the first four years were an absolute grind. Um, and you know, the first four years that we maxed out like 15, 20 people somewhere in there. And, mm-hmm. um, I didn't know, was, I still don't know what I'm doing, I, but I knew less of what I was doing then. And we were just trying, we didn't have market fit and we're just trying to make it work. And there's some parts about that. I really enjoy, like there mm-hmm. were some great parts about that. Uh, you're really living in that moment. But I would say the next four years when we landed our series a funding, um, and we really started to execute at a high level. We really found market fit. I think the most important thing we found is our marketing message and our voice mm-hmm. um, to be able to, to to break ourselves apart from the rest of the audience, really double down the product areas that mattered, started to bring on just incredible customers. And then we got our series B like that. That timing was so much fun because mm-hmm. you're not worried as much about, am I going to make numbers next quarter? Am I going to make numbers this year? Like you're still worried about it. It still keeps you up. But it's not like earliest stage of the company. I remember we were two weeks away from running out of money and I was in the delivery room with my wife uh, going into labor and I had to sign our Series A paperwork <laughs> in the delivery room because oh, I was like, I got to get this done or we're going to run out of money. Like, it, you know, and it, the, would I relive that moment again? Probably not. Um, <laughs> but, but the next ones, you know, like absolutely. And I think uh, it, it was just a ton of fun those last couple of years. So last like scaling from 25 to 75 was just a ton of fun. Yeah, I honestly, I think that's right. Ram. When we joined too, we, we were partnered up at that point. You guys had just moved into a really cush office. You know, that those are good times. I mean, you you, you were able to create, really reinforce that culture too at that point. A little bit of, mo- a little bit of money coming through and uh, just taking care of people. It, it was a really good time. Um, I want to talk a b- little bit about, uh, before we transition a little bit more into Loric, I want to talk a little bit more about this transition, you know, the post-acquisition for yourself, um, you know, going into Rapid7. So, you know, there's always some some terms that apply, right? You, you got to stick around for X amount of time. Um, you know, what, what was that like for you, uh, you know, going from the, you know, the, the, the rapid, you know, grow startup environment uh, into, you know, a big stable organization, uh, solidifying a role there. Tell me a little bit about that transition and then tell me a little bit about, you know, why, you know, maybe that, that wasn't the long, long-term fit for you. Sure. Well, I mean, I start off by saying that we got really lucky. Rapid7 is a fantastic company. So we, we joined a great team. Um, the, the culture there mirrored ours. They really invest in the people like we did. And, and that was really meaningful. So when I made the transition, I was actually really excited because it was an opportunity to, try something new. Um, I was going to be an executive at a publicly traded company and all those kind of crazy stuff. And I was super excited. It was great for my ego. And uh, I, you know, it was going to be a lot of fun. I was, you know, the team was going to grow and almost double in size. Uh, I think when we left, we were hundred and something, 140 plus or something like that. And it was, I was super excited about the transition, even though I was sad to, to be leaving the startup behind, like leaving that kind of like owning the company behind. But on, on the other hand, Rapid7 did a great job of dropping the product in place, and we could, you know, we sort of took over a division of Rapid7, so we got to kind of op, you know, operate fairly autonomously. There's a whole thing about like how COVID even impacted that. We can go into another time, but like the impact of everyone working working remotely at that time also had a big impact on that. But I think as I started that process, and uh, and you know, if Corey ever listens to this, he won't be surprised by this because we had lots of conversations about it. You know, I just started thinking about. You know, about six or seven months in, I, I just said, look, you know, this role requires a different set of skills, a leader, an executive in a publicly traded company than the kind of skills that I had and the kind of skills that I wanted to have. And so I think any anybody can learn anything if they want to and anybody can change if they want to, but you have to want to. And so I think as I was playing a role as an executive in a company of that size, um, my role changed a lot from being more hands on with the people more hands, you know, I was, I was less, I was less hands-on with the people actually working on the product. I was less hands-on with the actual product and I was doing more of a company building at a higher level. And while that stuff can be really fun, it's just not where my soul was or my heart was. And so, and, and to be fair, I wasn't very good at it. Um, you know, I think in the end I, I went to Corey, the CEO, and I said, look, this, I'm not particularly great at this job and you could find someone who's really much better at it than I am. I could get good at it, but I don't know that I want to. 
Um, and it was that sort of level of transparency and openness that Rapid7 and Corey in particular had that allowed us to find a really good path. I mean, I didn't have any reasons to stay. They, they, didn't, they didn't hold anything back from me from like, I didn't have to stay if I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had open conversation about it. And so I think for me, lesson learned, like just be open and transparent with the people around you. Trust their ability to have emotional intelligence and be able to have a rational conversation with you. And if you do, you're not surprising people with anything. And that's really all they want. They just want to not be surprised. I ended up staying on a Rapid7 for another, you know, all the way through a good portion of the next year. And, and really sort of helping that transition finalize. I, you know, helped lead an acquisition during that period of time um, mm. and had a great experience. But in the end, it just, that comp that large company just wasn't right for me. Yeah. I mean, and good for you for acknowledging it and listening to yourself. You know, a lot of folks will get comfortable and, and uh, just kind of keep coasting, but you uh, sound like you also had a, had a, an itch, right? Something, something was, uh, you, you had to go pursue something else. And that's kind of lead us into what's going on over here at Loric Games. So um, tell me a little bit about, you know, I, I'm always curious about this. Like, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about like starting that next thing, um, you know, is this, this is happening over a course of, you know, months that you're syncing up with, with some of these, some of this crew from the past life, um, you know, are you guys meeting up and, and talking about this idea and it's just tell me, tell me a little bit about that transition and like how you get the group of founders together. Yeah, I, uh, no. So first off, I'll say that the, I had a, a just a tremendous difficult, uh, the investors were actually fantastic, which is not something you hear very often. The board, I, I became very good, good friends with the board members. And one of them is George Kretzel, who's the man, uh, managing director over at Mission OG. And, um, I called him and I was like, so I kind of want to go do something else. You know, should I just go do it? And his advice to me was, why don't you just take some time and get bored first? And I was like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> so, so I sort of took time off work. Like I, I left rapid seven and I spent the next roughly, I would say eight months from the moment that I was no longer working day to day. And I really spent it with my family and I spent time doing stuff. And I remember, sort of sitting around and I was content and happy, but I had this like need to go do something else and do something again. And I really waited until I got bored. And and then, you know, all along though, it's not like I wasn't fostering it. I was going to have lunch with Rob, my co-founder. Um, and one of my other co-founders, Ray, I met up with him for dinner and we were talking, just sort of batting ideas around. And then finally, I just sort of got to that point and I was like, you know, I just, I need to do this. And, and there was an interesting moment here where in my, you know, it's different than the first time you do it. This time around, your back's not against the wall. You, you know, if it doesn't work, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's going to be okay. So, so that was a little different. And I sort of dipped my toe in. Rob and I put money into the studio. We found a founding team, all former mythic people that we wanted to work with. We got them in place. We started ramping things up in June. And I would say come November of that year, so this is last November, mm -hmm. uh, my wife was like, are you okay? And I was just like, you know, I am, but I'm not. I was trying to find a balance between I didn't want to go back to being the entrepreneur uh, husband who was never around and the father who was having a hard time finding time with his kids. Like I didn't want to get back to that. So I was sort of holding back. And I said, you know, I'm not 100% in because I'm worried about what that's going to do for my balance. And she sort of looked at me and she really encouraged me. And she said, look, you're clearly like it's bothering you. And you're not going to be present if you're bothered. Trust that you have learned lessons from the past. Mm -hmm. Apply them moving forward, but go put yourself fully into it. And since then, I've just been 110% in and loving every minute of it, but still making sure that I am listening to the, that, that little voice in the back of my head about like, hey, you, know, you don't need to have that meeting tonight. You can go 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 hang out with the kids. Right? Like Having that has been awesome. Wow. Yeah, your wife. I mean, it sounds like an awesome person too. Like that's that's a that's a great support system. You got to have that, right? I mean, with, without that, you know, you're kind of on your own island. Um, I know firsthand too. My wife, she handles a lot of a lot of my shit, you know, as a as a small small business owner, and it's you know it it's so important to to have that support system. Um, so then, you know, you you got uh, you got a, a crew uh, together here and. Um, you, you tapped some shoulders of some, some previous folks that you've leaned into from advisors to investors, um, all, you know, pillars, you know, when, when building a business, 
Um, was there anything that stood out to you um, from, um, yeah, just kind of like those early days that you you really wanted to make sure that you course corrected on from from the Divi Cloud early days? Obviously, it's a little bit of a different environment, but were there things that you're like, oh, I know for sure I'm not <laughs> not doing that this time? You know, it's, it's funny. Um, there's actually two parts to that. There are certainly things that I look at and go, I'm not repeating that. One of them is um, you, you, you can hire faster because you know what you're looking for. Uh, you get HR systems in place faster. And so you just, you learn the first time around is really an experience in learning what matters and how to prioritize. I remember Chris, my co-founder and I at Divi spending days arguing about minute details of the new SaaS service that we were going to launch. And we like, cranked at it for like months and we argued and we debated and all this stuff. And then we launched it and nobody signed up and it didn't matter. <laughs> like, and so like, you just, you take those moments and go, what really mattered? And you get better at saying, you know, these things don't matter. One of my advisors gave me great advice. You're going to, you're going to make a thousand decisions this year, maybe a million, five of them are going to matter. And so the question is which five, and that's what you should focus on. Like, as you're thinking about decisions, is this one really one I have to worry about? Or can I let people around me make the decisions and own it? And do I really need to be involved? And I think that's something that I grew and learned at, at Divi that I'm taking on here. Mm -hmm. I think the, the flip side of that that I, I'm finding interesting is that sometimes as an entrepreneur a second time, you focus on like, oh, I'm never gonna do those things again. But actually it's important to every now and again, sit down and say, but what things did I do right that I need to make sure I repeat? And uh, that I think is something more recently within the last couple of months I've been paying attention to, which is I started focusing on all the things I wasn't going to do. Mm -hmm. And instead of thinking about all the things of like, yeah, but these things worked and I need to do them again. Um, yeah. and, and I think, and not taking them for granted and, and culture is of course one of them. Right. Um, you know, making sure we're hiring the right people and that kind of stuff. So I'd say that's almost as important as the things you don't want to repeat. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, uh, with the, with Lithic, uh, let's let's dive a little bit deeper into into what you guys are doing here. So, you've been around for how long now? Uh, we, the company was officially founded in June of 2020, so not very long. Okay. Um, wait, June of 2020. 2022. Sorry. 2022. Okay. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute. Um, Excuse me. I was like, oh, you were doing this on the side at Rapid Seven. No, no, I'm no, no, no. 2022. <laughs> uh, 2022. So then, um, and what, what, uh, what's the size of the of the team now? How how big is um is the we're, the team over there? We're 12 people now, uh, including okay. my my co-founder, well, Rob Denton and myself, the investors, and I have other co-founders. So I sometimes call Rob. All I say is Rob and I are the ones who put money into it, but we have actually a whole team of co-founders that really. We're there the day the studio was founded. Wow. Um, we're employees on day one. We had about four of them. Um, and they all bring a ton to the table. Amazing people to have around Ray Soto and, and Gabe Carter and Joe and Colin. These are just like amazing people to have on your side of your team. So what are those skill sets? Was, well, Colin is our CTO. Ray is our art director. Gabe is our lead designer. And, and Joe actually designs and programs, which is an incredible skill to have. Wow. You sort of go back and forth. Uh, Colin, I worked with at Mythic. He was my boss actually at Mythic. He was the CTO there as well. Cool. Uh, Ray was an art director at Mythic when I was there. Rob obviously founded Mythic. So these are all a good chunk of them I'd all worked with before. I yeah. uh, was excited to work with again. In fact, uh, Colin reminded me recently that on my last day at Mythic before I left to go create Divi, I stopped by Colin's office to say, to say goodbye. And he reminded me that as I was leaving, I said, hey, look, I'm going to go start this company. And when I'm done, we're going to go create a game studio. I totally forgot that I said that. And he reminded me of that recently. And I was like, well, there you go. It actually happened. <laughs> do you do uh, like tarot card readings as well? Like that's, uh, <laughs> you had a crystal ball. That's awesome. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to, uh, I want to jump into a couple more questions about Lorik and then we'll, then we'll close with a, um, a rapid fire Q and a segment. Um, but um, you know, with, with uh, Lorik games, you know, what, um, you know, what uh, type of uh, types of, folks th uh, are going to thrive here? You know, what types of skill set do you like to, to hire for over here? Well, again, going back to sort of the passion, you know, high emotional IQ and the drive, those are the things that are going to matter. The good thing about the game industry is passion is not hard to come by. Right. Uh, people go to the game industry because they want to. You make less money in the game industry than you can make other places, but you're here because you love gaming and you love making people happy and, and that's what drives you. Yeah. Um, 
obviously the high emotional IQ is also important. Uh, you know, making sure that you, you're a good teammate, you work with people and then drive. I mean, it's a startup. We're, we're not, this company is not going to get bigger than 30 or 35 people. That's something Rob and I sort of talked about early on. Hmm. Um, and so part of that means that everyone's got to own pieces of what they do. They want to leave their marks. So those are the things we're really looking for. Skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, we need people that we'd like it if people have, had uh, launched or worked on a game before. It's always good to have credits under your belt. Um, not necessary. And I think the other thing we're going to be looking for is we have a remote workforce as of right now. A lot of people are remote, but we're going to start staffing up here locally mm -hmm. um, and really start building a local culture around uh, around our game studio. Yeah, that's an important thing to point out, right? It sounds like that was important to you at Divi and it's going to be important to you here that that foundational group, you know, you want them local, you want folks to come and, and have that camaraderie. Um, so, so um, you know, to put a bow on it with with Lorik, you know, what what can folks really be excited about? What what might they see here in 2023? Look, I mean, nothing, uh, nothing we do publicly, <laughs> maybe some artists today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think what really they're going to see, uh, you know, and what if they're looking and are interested in what we're doing, you know, I would say it's not what they're going to see, but what they're going to find if they come and explore and spend some time with us. And what they're going to find is a group of really passionate people who are trying to build something that they're really proud of. And I think that it's an industry you can do that in uniquely, uh, whereas other industries like enterprise software and that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're proud of what you're building, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, you know, you know that you're building software that some CIO or ops person is going to use every day. And that's awesome. It's different when you're building a piece of software, that you know, people are going to look forward to coming home to after work, who are going to look forward to spending time with their friends playing. And so that's just incredibly exciting and awesome. And so I think if people are looking at what we're doing, I'd pay attention to the type of company we're building. And that's what we're building, a company mm -hmm. full of people who want to go and build something really awesome and be really proud of it. That's awesome. Good stuff, man. I can't wait to to keep tracking it. We're excited here as well. Uh, I'm going to transition here. It's one of my my favorite parts here. This is called the five second scramble. So we're going to do a couple rapid fire questions. You know, try to keep them under five seconds on your answers. Uh, mix of business and personal. So uh, we'll kick it off here real quick. So explain to me, you know, what Loric Games does as if I was a five year old. We make badass video games. I wouldn't say it's a five-year-old though. <laughs> yeah, you could. Why not? It's 2023. Um, <laughs> what makes your studio different than other studios? That's hard to say. I would say the people and the focus on the people. That matters. A lot of studios focus on product. We're focused on people. What is your favorite aspect about working at Loric? The people. The people. <laughs> kind of keep it's, you that it, one up. It's what it is. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> What aspect of your culture do you fear most losing with growth? Uh, connection with people. I think mm -hmm. in the end, and that's actually part of the remote thing as well. Making sure you're building real relationships that are not transactional. Mm -hmm. Is there anything about your work that keeps you up at night? Building a crappy game. <laughs> Probably the number one thing. What is, uh, what's your favorite, um, favorite cereal? Ooh, uh, Honey Nut Checks and, oh. oh, and Lucky Charms. Lucky Charms classic. Uh, if I caught you at an airport waiting for a flight, what's, uh, what's your drink of choice? Ooh, at an airport, it's going to be a beer or a Bloody Mary. Nice. What, uh, who's a tech entrepreneur that you find fascinating? Fascinating? In what way? Morbidly? Uh, that would be Elon sure. Musk. Must. Uh, <laughs> as from a morbid perspective, uh, I would say the one that I, 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 you know, there's a lot that I look up to um, across the board, but you know, everyone said Steve Jobs always gets up there because he's just like, like any entrepreneur who just said, screw you to the, to the world and did what they want to do. I love, but yeah. you know, I think I will go back to Musk. So the guy's a jerk. He's an ass, but I also, it's hard to point at anybody else who has done the things that he's done with rockets and with, Mm -hmm. cars and with everything he's the he is the antithesis of someone who says i can do it and i'm not going to let anybody tell me otherwise and i think that's awesome now yeah. he, he, the person sucks but yeah whatever. <laughs> what um what do you love most about yourself uh i think i'm pretty good at making people happy but i don't know that okay do you believe there's life on other planets yes 
Favorite app on your phone? Uh, Slack. <laughs> the greatest video game of all time. Oh, you can't do that to me. That's not fair. <laughs> uh, uh, hold on. I don't know if this is something people see. This. Colonel's Bequest. Oh, by dang. C- done by Sierra. That's a classic, huh? Heck yeah, man. What is your favorite Disney character? Disney? Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I, keep, I keep thinking Aladdin, but that can't possibly be true. But we'll go with it. Sure. Dude, that's my favorite. That's the that's same as me, go. man. Yeah. That's the right answer. Scrooge um, <laughs> bars, right, man? Well, this has been a blast, Brian. I appreciate you uh, spending some time with us here on the Pair Program and telling the story and uh, again, you know, love love the innovation that's happening here locally in the area, and uh, we're rooting for you guys. Oh man, thanks very much for having me on. For sure.